Thank you, everyone, um, for coming here today. Um, so um, I'm sure a lot of you here might uh, not know me personally. My name is Monica Wanganisao. Um, and yeah, I'm here to um, talk about um, identity. And in saying that, I wanted to share with you a part of my story um, on the self-ownership of self. Um, so I just put together a, a quick little PowerPoint just to help me along. Um, so when Sharon had asked me to um, come and speak today, um, and thinking about the theme of you know finding your happiness, I wanted to take this opportunity to share a story that. Excuse me if I do get a bit emotional because this is the first time for me to finally have a chance to articulate it in front of people. So anyway, um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I, I didn't always look like, like this, what I look like now. In fact, two years ago, I used to look more like Oh, like this. So that was me two years ago, um, which I'm sure a lot of you might find a bit surprising considering my physical appearance now. I'm, um, I'm mostly white, whereas before I was one color. In saying that, um, so around this time two years ago, I, I was diagnosed with a very, um, very rare skin condition, um, which caused my um, melanin, which we all have in our skin. So for me, my, it's an autoimmune condition. And what happened was that uh, my immune system um, basically took, uh, saw my melanin as a foreign, foreign body in my, um, in my system, and it started to break down. So, that's what caused me to then starting to um, turn white. Um, in saying that, um, it's, it's a unique condition in that uh, not every person that has it um, changes the same. It's, it's different for, for everyone. So as I was going, sorry, let me just take a step back here. So that was two years ago. So I went to the doctor, and um, so I go into my GP, and then he goes like this to me. It, it started with um, these little white spots on my hand. It started appearing on my hand. And my, my lips started turning this bright pink. So, uh, you know, and friends would, were, would make remarks, and they're like, oh, you know, what's up with your, your lips? Is that, a, is that a fancy new lip gloss that you got on? I was like, oh, okay. And I, and I live a very active lifestyle, as, as most Pacific Islanders do. You know, I love being in the sun. I like going hiking and swimming. So when the spots started to appear on my hands, it was just like little tiny spots. I just assumed that it was a bad case of a sunburn. So I went to the, I went to the super private, and um, you know, my GP saw me. And the doctor, when I showed him my hands, the first thing he says to me was, well, you know, Monica, we can do all the, um, um, all the usual tests, but I can tell you right now, it looks like it's vitiligo. It's like, hmm. I had, you know, I'm, I, my day job, I'm also a researcher, so I'd kind of done my homework a little before going. And when I say my homework, I basically just Googled, you know, like, um, the symptoms, and I got onto WebMD, and I was like, okay. I was like, I hope he doesn't say what I think it is. So, being the stubborn person that I am, I said, well, you know, I still insist um, that I get all the tests done. So they did the skin biopsy, I got the blood tests and everything, and it came back a couple of weeks later, and it was confirmed, it was vitiligo. 
Um, so this was around early April of uh, 2014. And um, I was working for a women's organization then. Um, you know, it was a, a job that demanded a lot, not just mentally, but also emotionally. Um, you know, I was, I was dealing with working with a lot of grassroots women, and, you know, um, part of my job was I was an advocate for human rights. I was talking and teaching and doing research around that. So the first three months, I'll be honest, you know, I I put on a brave face, but it was very daunting and scary because while while most people might go through a change in their life, not many are forced to deal with it publicly. My newfound condition it forced me to deal with it publicly because it was so external. I couldn't hide it. So as I was processing those, those first three months were sort of my darkest. I had to really process, okay, I am changing in my young life. Like there were times, and I'm happy that my partner is here. He'll know very well. There were times I would wake up in the morning. Excuse me. Get it together, girl. So anyway, those first three months, sometimes I'd wake up like this in the morning and I'd be lying there in bed and I'd be too scared to go and brush my teeth because the first thought that would come to my mind was, shit, how am I going to look like today? So, yeah, it was a it was a struggle. Um, those first three dark months. Um, yeah, and then so so I'm, my my face, my hands were the first to quickly turn white. Um, and then as I was um, as I was struggling through that, I thought, okay, you know what? I need to take a step back. So I, I decided to quit my job. And this was my first job straight out of uni. Um, it had been something that I chose specifically because um, I was passionate about human rights. Um, I had studied law in university. And I, I felt like I wanted to be in a space that encompassed those principles. I wanted to do something that I passionately believed about. But after the diagnosis and going through that internal um, process, I thought, OK, you know what? I need to take a step back. So I did one of the, the, the scariest things. At that point in time in my life, I decided to quit my job. Um, and so I did that, and I, I just, you know, I just needed a break. I needed a break away from the, um, the, the, the movement of, uh, you know, human rights. And I went and I did something completely different. I went and I um, volunteered for Wild Kids Fiji, and uh, they had set up this project where um, uh, to fundraise for terminally ill children, we were going to try and uh, bring together money to open up a resource center. And this friend of mine then, uh, Jeremy Duxbury, had this crazy idea. He was like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to walk around Vitilevu, and that's how we're going to collect money. And if they ask us why we're collecting money, we're doing it for the children of Fiji. 
We're doing it for, you know, kids with cancer, with, term with terminal illnesses, so that they can have a space, you know, aside from um, the hospital where they have their treatments, where they can go and feel like a kid again. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. And for me, this was also a, a part of my turning point. So I went and I did this. We walked around Vitilevu for about two weeks. In fact, it was almost like my uh, eat, pray, love moment, if you will. And it was truly humbling. Um, you know, as we did that, like, we met along the way a lot of um, wonderful people, you know, that shared their stories of their families and their children, um, the struggles that they had, um, having to, you know, deal with a terminal illness. And it was a great time, too, because it, for me it was, a, it was another wake-up call, like, this is true, um, you know, the true human spirit. We come together. So then I did that, and then I came back, came back to Suva. Um, and um, again, it was like, it was a, finding my... Um, finding myself again. And um, after, the, after, that, uh, after doing that, I also went into a, a time of self-reflection. And I was thinking to myself, and, and this had been uh, a couple of months from the time I had gotten diagnosed, and I was thinking, man, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I am fortunate. Um, my condition, while it might be external and something that I have to deal with, I'm fortunate that it's, it's not terminal, you know? Um, in the grand scheme of things, I, you know, still have um, wonderful family, wonderful friends. I can look forward to tomorrow, and it hasn't really impinged on my quality of life. So... Being also the, so I put, the, it's called vitiligo. I had a fun time too, the first time I heard it. I was like, what, viti what? So, you know, trying to get through that and now I can just run it off my mouth, vitiligo. You know, I've had about two years wrapping it in my head that it's so familiar. And being the true blue millennial that I am as well, uh, you know, savvy with social media, I thought, you know, while I process this, while I'm going out and having these experiences, I'm going to start sharing it. Um, um, you know, I'm going to start taking ownership of my story. Or, as we CSO cats like to say, I'm going to frame my narrative. <laughs> so I started posting up pictures of myself as I progressed in my change. So these two pictures were two of the first pictures I started putting out there. So I put it out on Instagram, and I'd share it across on Facebook, and I'd just put a little blurb, like, um, you know, this is me dealing with LIGO. And I started, like, putting it out there, putting um, blurbs that just, you know, consumer-friendly, just telling people what I had. And in, in, in a way, too, it was... Um, a way of me kind of mitigating so that when my friends and family see me on the street, they don't freak out. Like, oh shit, what happened to you? And, and, and to be honest, I got a bit of that in the beginning. And you're know, well-meaning family and friends, and they come up to you on the street and they're like, oh, it's a Lufengu, what happened to your face? I was like, did you, did you get burnt? So I was like, ah, uh, you know, um, no, I have this um, skin condition. So, I, you know, it's the same old drivel kept going. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to save my time. And I'm just going to start putting it out there so that when people see me on the street, they don't freak. So I, I personalized it. And, I, and, and, and I, in a way, like, it was almost for me like, I'm also a feminist. And one of our principles is the personal is political. And in saying that, like I thought, hmm, this is a very personal issue for me, but I want to also show people that 
you know, I'm okay with it and I'm dealing. And I want to share with you as I process it as well. And as I went through that, it was really fantastic because then I, I kind of found my tribe. <laughs> so um, I did this research online and, it, and it, was, it was just awesome. Like, I found people that were, that were like me, but, but different, you know? Same, same, but different. And just reading some of their stories was just like, wow. I was like, it was amazing. Like, you know, for, for my condition, like the poster child for it is obviously Michael Jackson, you know? Successful singer, pe people didn't understand why he was turning white. They automatically assumed that he was bleaching his skin. No, his melanin was, you know, just, just dying, and he had to quickly try and um, deal with that. For me personally, I don't know if I will ever get to Michael Jackson's stage where I will completely turn white. I don't know. I might, you know, just be as I am, or it might go um, all white. But it was great too. Like, I'm just going to move aside here. Like, if you see some of these pictures. Um, and it's a very diverse range. I really like this picture of the father and the daughter. Um, their story is really unique. So for this young woman, her father had vitiligo. So when she was growing up, she's just like me, just your normal, you know, brown, brown kid. And but she had grown up with a dad that had vitiligo. And she, when she was telling her story, and I discovered her online, and she was uh, talking about how she used to always be very defensive uh, for her dad when they would be out in public. But the dad used to be very cool about things, like, you know, you've, after a couple of years of living with it, you don't really uh, think about it any, any, any longer. And she used to um, get very defensive when she would see people in public staring at her dad. And then one day her father, you know, pulled her aside and said, you know, it's all right, like, for me, I'm okay with this, and I just want you kids to be happy and try not to think too much about my condition. So when she started to get vitiligo, she got it in um, when she was in college, university. And by then, you know, she had come to, and, and again, this, I, I'm, I'm, I assume that this is something that probably happens to all of us that gets vitiligo, um, that, that change, yeah? you coming to terms with it and trying to accept it. So I, I liked her story because she had someone when she was growing up that she looked up to so that by the time she got it, it was, it was just like second nature. It's just like, it's just my skin. And the other pictures that I have here, uh, there in the middle is Chantelle Winnie. Uh, and she's a beautiful girl. And you can see that her, her sports are more um, asymmetrical. Um, when I was uh, going through that first year, and I used to have all these friends tagging me to her pictures. And I was like, oh, okay, what's this? Is she the other poster child for vitiligo? And again, it was great, and then I read her fabulous story. Um, most of you might not know this, but she's actually a very successful um, uh, model on the international catwalk. And, you know, reading on their stories, it kind of helped me. And I was like, wow, these are all these brave young people with the same condition that I have, and most of them here are, in fact, models. So they were taking something that wouldn't, you know, be considered the normal definition of beauty, taking the same skin condition and taking ownership and celebrating it. And I really liked that. And for me, through that first year, reading that and feeling the sense of community, and I came across these fantastic pages. Like, there were pages on Tumblr, on Instagram, where all these people with this condition were, were celebrating, the, celebrating it. And I thought, wow, you know, that's fantastic. And again, it helped me deal. And so, um, <laughs> this picture. 
So as I, as I started sharing like a Care Bear, um, again, I'm just putting this out there. This was again one of my first, first little spotty selfies. And it really tickled me. Like I'd have friends who, you know, some of them, they wouldn't post it on the picture. They'd privately message and they'd go, oh, I'm so sorry to hear what, you know, like somebody had died. I was like, okay. And again, by, by sharing it, by putting it out there publicly, it, it, it brought me back. Like it, it um, brought me back to a sense of equilibrium. And I used that as my way of, again, framing my story. And so whenever somebody would ask, because I knew, like, you know, generally it's not coming from a bad place. It's human nature to, uh, to be curious. So I didn't take any offense to it when someone would, like, you know, put all the freaked out emojicons and the, oh my God, what happens? I'd take my time and, you know, I'd explain what I have. I was like, it's a rare autoimmune condition. Uh, it's nothing terminal. It's not something you can. So I took something that I used to do, that I, that I do well in my day job, and I used the same toolkit, if you will, to start telling my story, my personal story. And I, I noticed that the more I did that, um, the more I put it out there, I was also educating people about what it is I had. And yeah, as you can see then, you know, my, it, those first three months just kinda was a little pinge into my vanity, but then after that I just channeled my inner Beyonce and I was just like, work it. I'm just gonna put out my selfies. <laughs> so I just, I just kept doing that so that now, and it's, it's really great, like in my day job, in uh, the work that I do, and I live here in Suva, it's great that um, when I meet people now, they don't freak out. <laughs> you know, they still know that aside from my very external change, I'm still the same person. Um, I'm still Fijian, even though I'm turning white. <laughs> Wait, but technically we're all Fijian, so yes. <laughs> yeah, and um, I guess that, that comes to the, the end of my talk. Um, and yeah, so again, it was me coming to terms with this big change in what I had perceived as my identity. You know, for the first 27 years of my life, I was very sure of who I was, what I wanted to be. Um, I knew what, well, I had an idea of what my trajectory was, uh, not, not just professionally, but also, um, you know, where I wanted to be family-wise and, um, and all of that. And then being struck by such a change, um, in the middle of my life, hey, God willing. Um, I'm at this point two years on, I can say, I'm happy that it happened because it forced me out of my comfort zone. It made me reflective of myself as a person, who I want to be. It made me look consciously of I don't want to be someone that's just viewed um, or framed in the opinions of others by how I look. I want people, when they interact with me, they look beyond that, that they know me as a person. And it was great because that's like my first exterior. It was just a, a kick to my vanity, you know? And I quickly got over that. And. Yes, and I came back to my sense of self, and I took ownership of it. Um, and I realized that it is not my all, it's not my entirety, my skin condition. Um, it might be the first thing that you see, but I am still evolving as a person and finding out every day what makes me happy. Um, it's not just how I look. 
And in saying that, I, I wanted to just end off with this. And this quote by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, which is this fantastic um, Nigerian uh, storyteller and writer. And um, a single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story the only story. And I hope that by sharing with you a part of my story, you'll go away knowing more about, you know, something like a skin condition like vitiligo. And in your day to day, be able to look at others beyond just the exterior. Thank you. <laughs>